Federal Judicial Center. I'm Jim Chance, Senior Judicial Education Attorney at the FJC, and this is Term Talk. In each 8 to 12 minute episode, we discuss what the lower courts need to know about the Supreme Court's most impactful decisions of this term. Joining me today is Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean and Jesse H. Choper Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley, and former Tenth Circuit Judge Michael McConnell, Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford. Thank you both for joining us today. We'll be discussing a few other First Amendment cases in another episode, but today we're talking about City of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising and Shirtliff versus City of Boston. These opinions don't alter how we interpret First Amendment law, but they do help clarify a few terms we often use to discuss free speech rights. So first, let's talk about City of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising. This is a 6-3 opinion that gives us a better understanding of content-based versus content-neutral regulation. Erwin, what was the City of Austin trying to do, and how did the lower courts analyze whether it was a First Amendment violation? The city of Austin was regulating digital ads on buildings. Generally, it said that digital ads would be allowed if they're about what's going on on the premises of the building, but digital ads would not be allowed if they're about activities were off the premises of the building. And the issue is, should this be regarded as a content-based or a content-neutral regulation? This is a distinction that's so important in First Amendment law. Content-based regulations generally have to meet strict scrutiny. They have to be necessary to achieve a compelling government purpose. Whereas content-neutral regulations only have to meet an immediate scrutiny, being substantially related to an important government purpose. Here, Reagan National Advertising said that the city of Austin regulation was content-based. The federal district court rejected that argument. The district court regarded it as content-neutral and upheld it. But the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit reversed. The Fifth Circuit said whether the regulation applies requires looking at what's written in the message. That's content-based. The Court of Appeals used strict scrutiny and declared this unconstitutional. Michael, can you take us through the Supreme Court's analysis? The billboard cases have been a matter of confusion for uh, decades. Uh, and, and, and the first Supreme Court billboard case, Metro Media, uh, the opinion for Justice White actually declared that there's a law of billboards, you know, as if we have a billboard clause in the, in the Constitution. This case, I think, is an attempt to uh, bring billboard regulation law into uh, concert with more general principles of free speech law. This case... Uh, and, and the, the majority opinion by Justice Sotomayor declared that the distinction between on-premises and off-premises signs is content neutral. The lower court and the dissenters both applied what they call a common sense understanding of what is content-based, which is that you need to be able to read the sign in order to enforce uh, the ordinance. I think that Justice Sotomayor's opinion here is going to present a great deal of difficulty uh, to lower courts because instead of this relatively commonsensical view, um, the court offered a number of uh, reasons why, uh, why this sign uh, they say is not content-based, even though you do have to read the content in order to, to enforce it. I think the most important of those is that the distinction between on-premises and off-premises signs has been with us uh, since the very beginning of billboard regulation, which doesn't go back to the founding, but it does go back to, about, to the um, mid-1960s. And it seems this is a distinction that has is so far afield from any actual attempt to suppress a point of view or a perspective uh, that it seems to present very little uh, threat to uh, First Amendment values. So I think what you have here is a clash between desiring a categorical uh, approach, which is relatively easy to apply, uh, versus a much more uh, contextual approach, which is going to lead to probably inconsistent results and a lot more uh, difficulty of adjudication. So Erwin, where do you think this leaves us? I disagree with Michael that this is going to cause great difficulty for the lower courts. I think it provides more clarity for the lower courts 
in terms of the distinction between content-based and content-neutral laws. The court says that a law is content-based in one of two circumstances. One is if it's a subject matter restriction of speech, that's where the application of law depends on the topic of the speech, or it's content-based if it's a viewpoint restriction, that's where the application of law depends on the ideology of the message. The court rejects the dissent's approach. The dissent says if you have to look at the message to decide, that automatically makes it content-based. The majority says that would make everything content-based because you always have to look at the message. So I think this does provide important guidance and clarification for lower courts. All right, thank you. Let's move on to Shirtliff versus Boston. This case involves the different analyses applied when the uh, government is the speaker, uh, the First Amendment doesn't apply, and when they're the provider of a forum that encourages private speech, in which case it does apply. Michael, will you get us started on uh, Shirtliff, please? So the facts here are easy to understand. Uh, Boston City Hall uh, has an area, a little plaza in front. There are three flagpoles. On one of the flagpoles, they always fly the American flag. On one of the flagpoles, they always fly the Massachusetts flag. On the third pole, they usually fly the city of Boston flag. Uh, but over the years, they've adopted a practice. There's no real rule or regulation about this, but a practice of allowing civic groups to come and have a little ceremony in the plaza. And when they want to, they, uh, they can fly uh, their own flag. Uh, this has happened numerous times, over 250 times. No group has ever been turned down before this case. But in this case, a religious group uh, with a, uh, calling itself you know, camp, a constitution camp, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a religious group wanted to f fly what it called the Christian flag, and the city said, no, you can't do that because you know, having a Christian flag, a flag with a cross, uh, flying in front of the city hall uh, would create an appearance of an endorsement from the city of Boston of, of uh, that symbol of the Christian uh, religion. And so they said a no to that. Uh, the court uh, unanimously, in a majority opinion by uh, Justice Breyer, uh, said that the city was wrong, that when, when the government creates a forum for private speech where a number of different private speakers are able to express messages on government property and using government facilities like flagpoles, uh, that it is not government speech and in instead uh, the government has to be neutral with regard to its message. One thing I think is interesting about this and worth uh, emphasizing is that the way in which it eliminates any tension between the Establishment Clause on the one hand and the Free Speech Clause on the other. Uh, if speech is private in nature, then it is covered by free speech and the Establishment Clause doesn't apply because uh, Establishment Clause applies to governmental actions and messages, not to private ones. Or when this case also implicates the Establishment Clause and incorporates the court's reasoning from other cases they opined on this year, and that we'll cover in uh, other Term Talk episodes. But can you take us through the, the court's analysis in this case, please? When the government itself is the speaker, its speech can't be challenged as violating the free speech clause of the First Amendment. In earlier cases, the Supreme Court said, government issued license plates are government speech, or a park with monuments maintained by the government are government speech. The First Amendment applies when the government is creating a forum for private speech. Here, the Federal District Court and the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit said that the flagpole is government speech, and therefore it can't be said that the government's violating the speech clause of the First Amendment by excluding this flag. Justice Breyer, writing for the majority, and it was unanimous in result, said, this isn't government speech. He said here, Private groups were encouraged to put their flags on the flagpole, though they had to go through the procedures for approval. He emphasized that no prior request had ever been denied. In fact, 284 times groups had asked to raise their flags, and 284 times the requests had been granted. He said 
the request was denied based on a concern over the Establishment Clause, but since it wasn't the government speaking, there wasn't a problem with regard to the Establishment Clause. The government can't discriminate against religious speech in private forums. I think what's most important for the lower courts here is that Justice Breyer said that a holistic approach is to be used in determining whether something's government speech. He says, first, look at the history of the expression. Look at the public's perception of who is speaking. And look to the extent to which the government has controlled the expression. Based on all these factors, he said here, this isn't government speech, and that therefore it violated free speech to exclude this flag. Michael, what should the lower courts take away from this? I think the message for the lower courts is that uh, this, this is not a, div a divided sort of five to four-ish, you know, culture war uh, question. It's a fixed rule that when the government opens up uh, property for public expression, for private expression, uh, that religious speech is not a second class speech. I think what Michael says there is completely right, but I think it's also maybe harder in some instances than he makes it seem. Because there's still the question, is it the government is the speaker or is the government creating a forum for private speech? Once the government is the speaker, you can't use the free speech clause to challenge what it does, but the establishment clause is implicated. Where the government is creating a forum for private speech, then the establishment clause doesn't apply, but the free speech clause does. Professor McConnell, Dean Chemerinsky, thank you as always for joining us. We look forward to speaking with you both again.